Hi, I'm Rebecca Bruff, and I'm with the Beaufort Arts Council, and I'm excited to be here today. Today I want to talk about art, and specifically about art in writing. Um, art, all kinds of art, touches our lives in all kinds of ways. Art expresses, and it inspires, and it touches us, and it teaches us. Today I want to talk about the art of stories. Stories, stories change our lives. Artists tell stories in all sorts of ways, all kinds of artists. Artists tell stories through music and through painting and through cooking and through writing. And I'm a writer. So today I want to talk about the stories that we read and the stories that we write and the stories that we tell and how they have the power to change our lives. Seven years ago, when I lived in Texas, I visited the Low Country. It was my first experience here. And we only had a very brief time, but we managed to squeeze in a, a carriage ride through the historic district of downtown Beaufort. And in that brief hour, I heard the name of a man called Robert Smalls. And I heard his story. I had never heard his name before, and I'd never heard his story before. And it intrigued me. He intrigued me. His courage, his heroism, his contributions, his legacy, it all intrigued me. His story ignited my curiosity. Curiosity became exploration. And exploration became discovery. And I discovered how little I knew about our history. And I discovered how little I knew about the experiences of enslaved people in our country. And I discovered that some stories are amplified and some stories are silenced. And so to make a long story short, the story of Robert Smalls opened my eyes and my heart and my world and moved me across the country because I felt compelled, I really felt called to share his story with others. And so a few years ago, we moved to Beaufort so that I could research and write Trouble the Water. Here's what I know about stories. I know that stories connect us. And I want to share just a few words about that that I think might have been true for Robert himself. And this comes from the novel. The house on Prince Street was my home from the beginning, as were the shimmering rivers and tides, the marsh grasses and grand oaks, the fields of rice and cotton around us. In our room out back, my mother told me stories too dark to repeat and too important to forget. I played in the yard with the McKee children, and it wasn't until I was five or six that I understood that we were not part of the same family. I knew, of course, that my skin was dark and theirs was light. I knew that my mother and I slept in the quarters and back, and the McKees slept in fine beds in the big house. I knew that they were warmer in the winter and that sometimes they ate when we were hungry. And I knew that Liza Beth and Hank knew who their father was. I wished that I knew mine. I wished that George was my father or maybe even Henry McKee. They both raised me and taught me and protected me or tried to. I enjoyed their attention and seldom doubted their affection. This home and these people, this life, all of it was tangled together like the Spanish moss in the live oak trees. Even when we were unaware of it, we were part of each other's stories. Stories connect us. Here's another thing I know about stories. Stories shape us. Stories like creation myths and ancient legend, legends have always helped people make sense of their worlds and understand and find meaning in their worlds. Stories like fables and folk tales and cautionary tales stoke our imagination and help us to envision what we can't see and help us to learn about navigating challenges and obstacles. And stories of other people's lives and experiences, those are the stories that change us. Stories about people we've never met, places we've never been, experiences we've never had, those are the stories that expand our hearts and our minds. Those stories invite us to live for a moment or maybe a season 
in someone else's reality. These stories invite us to wonder and to care about other people. Stories take us, for a moment at least, out of our own lives and into another person's life. Henry David Thoreau put it this way, could a greater miracle take place than for us to look through each other's eyes for a moment? When I began writing Trouble the Water, in first person, from Robert Small's perspective, it was never lost on me that I had some enormous distances to bridge. How does a mature, white, privileged woman from West Texas in the 21st century express the experiences of a young, black, enslaved man in the American South over 150 years ago? I was attempting to cross distances of race and gender and culture and age and time and geography, and yet I wanted this man to have his own voice and his own story. And so I dug into what I do know, what I've learned and experienced in my own life and in listening to others about life and love and loss and injustice and anger and hope and longing and struggle. And then I listened for Smalls to speak to me in his voice about those very things so that I could honor his story. And he taught me. When we see the world through someone else's eyes, when we walk a bit in someone else's shoes or on their aching shoeless feet, when we feel another person's feelings, the fear, the love, the hopes, the dreams, our capacity for compassion grows. War may build empires, but it's compassion and empathy and love that sustains the human spirit and our lives together. Stories cultivate our compassion. Stories encourage empathy. But stories can also provoke us because the stories that shape each of us are all a little different. New stories may provoke us to disagreements and arguments. It can be hard for us to let go of the stories that we've held dear for our entire lives. Stories that we think define us. And when a new story comes along, a story that challenges our old ways of, of thinking and being, it threatens us. Educators call this cognitive dissonance. That collision of what we thought was true suddenly in conflict with evidence that demands that we re-examine it. As uncomfortable as that is, that place where our old narrative intersects with a new one, that's where learning happens, and it's real learning, learning that matters, learning that sticks. Stories help us do that. Stories change our lives. When Robert Small's story moved me to Buford a few years ago, I had so much to learn, and I still do, and if I'd known how hard it was going to be, I probably would have chickened out. If I'd known how gratifying it was going to be, I wouldn't have believed it. This one story provoked and challenged and stretched my understanding of history and the way it is and isn't taught. This one story stretched my understanding of slavery and issues of race and rights and how we still have so much work to do. This one story changed my life, changed my awareness, changed the way I see and act and read and speak and write. This one story changed me. So I believe in the power of stories. Where there is separation, there's pain. And where there's pain, there's story. And where there's story, there's understanding and misunderstanding. Listening and not listening. May we, separated peoples, estranged strangers, unfriended friends, divided communities, turn toward each other and turn toward our stories with understanding and listening, with argument and acceptance, with challenge and change and consolation and compassion, 
Because if healing will be found, if wholeness will be found, if hope will be found, they will be found in the pain and the beauty of our stories. Stories change our lives, and stories change the world. And I believe in stories. <laughs>